Welcome to our 555th meeting in our series of Distinguished Speaker Programs. My name is Lowe Mealby, and I have the privilege of serving as your president. Lowe, and, and uh, Larry, I want to, Lowe doesn't know this, but Larry was my uh, physician treating me for three years at his institute, so you did <laughs> put me on the right. Our distinguished speaker, Dr. Penelope Prong, has traveled to China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong over 200 times over the last four decades. After becoming one of the first American graduate students allowed into China in the 1970s, it was fully opened by President Jimmy Carter in 1979, seven years after Richard Nixon and then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger shocked the world by seeking reproachment between the two former enemies. Fluent in Mandarin as a result of her undergraduate studies at the University of Denver in 2001, she founded the China Research Center in Atlanta as a way to share her insightful knowledge of China's economy and its people. And it's the most populous country in the world with over 1.4 billion people. China spans five different time zones, borders 14 different countries, second only to Russia. The earliest mention of China is dated back to 1250 BC, and so the land of the Red Dragon has, in one form or another, been around for over three millennia, rivaling Egypt, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and India. In the Echo newsletter on your table, you can see her impressive background, but I want to highlight a few important points and then let our speaker talk to us about China's economy and the geopolitics of our current relationship. Importantly, you should know that while the China Research Center has worked with the Confucius Institute, it has never received any government funding from China, nor from that matter, from any government, including our own. The center is solely funded by corporate and private funding, so her comments today represent her professional and her personal view and not that of any government. Appropriately, Dr. Prime is a retired economics professor having earned her master's degree and her doctorate from the University of Michigan. She has taught economics at both U.S. universities and at U.S.-based universities in China and at the Ministry of Economics in Taiwan. She is a managing editor of China Currents, a research peri periodical on China, and she is a member of the National Committee for U.S.-China Relations. And she is co-author of two college textbooks Global Giant, Is China Changing the Rules of the Game? And Taiwan's Democracy, Economic and Political Challenges. Given what is happening in the world today vis-a-vis -vis Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Russia's burgeoning economic and political relationship with China, Dr. Prime's comments will be very relevant and timely. She continues on a daily basis to read Chinese newspapers, and scholarly texts so that she can stay abreast of current events in the third largest country in the world. Dramatic changes are occurring daily in China, and as we meet today, the Chinese stock market is crashing, with the Hong Kong China index down 7.2%, down 28% in the last month, and a whopping 45% in the last year. This is a loss of over $1.1 trillion in value due primarily to growing international concerns about China's ties to Russia, but also due to potential SEC delisting de de of some Chinese companies in the American <laughs> stock markets, and ongoing re regulatory concerns due to an overheated domestic housing market that is teetering on a potential total collapse. Moreover, China is once again locked down fighting a COVID outbreak impacting 51 million people that will continue to have dramatic impacts on global supply chains and thus the world's economy. Harris sorted out for us all, and I mispronounced her name in the beginning, so let me get it right this time. Dr. Penelope Prime, please give her a warm welcome. Okay, well, after that, it's a hard act to follow. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm pleased to be here. It is my first time to give a presentation in person since COVID, although we did many of them on Zoom and, and Skype and all over, over the, that time period. But it is, it is 
fun to look people in the eye and say, hi. <laughs> um, so my task today is to talk about US-China economic relations. And there is, of course, the influence of political relations and military relations, and I can touch on that to some extent. But I am an economist. I'm trained in international trade and economic development. And that's how I viewed and learned about China over all these decades. So that's what I'm going to focus on uh, primarily. And I, I will make a few remarks about Ukraine, but at the end. So what I'd like to do is really kind of set up what, um, you know, how I've done my research and how I thought about China's development over time. And I think that gives us a nice background to understand what's going on. Okay. This did work before. There we go. Uh, so, just a little bit of my background in addition to Barney's nice, uh, wonderful introduction that. Um, you know, I did start to study China at a time when the U.S. did not have relations um, with China. So I had, I was fortunate enough to visit in 1976. It's a long story, so I won't go into it here. But um, spent a month in China after just graduating with my um, undergrad in Chinese studies. So it was a wonderful opportunity, you know, very interesting time. Um, but it was a really different place, of course, than it is now. And it was just emerging into uh, the global system. They were very curious about us. We were curious about them. But they also were very hardworking and um, also proud of their history. But then, but you know, it's just starting to figure out where do we go from here. And so the picture on the, the top right is the skyline of Nanjing, the capital city of Jiangsu province. There was one tall building. <laughs> and it was just recently built. It was a Jinlin Hotel. And I forget which foreign investment it, 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 it was from, which country. But that's, that's what it looked like. And the city had literally five restaurants in the whole city for four million people. So it's that. So it's just it was just it's just so totally different. Um, but having said that, I also feel that the more I study China, the less I really know. And I think the reason I, I say that is because it's so complex. You know, there's all these layers of understanding and complexity that I think it's it's you know. Sometimes we make things too simple, or we want a simple answer that just doesn't exist. So with, with that in mind, these are three things that I tell my students when we visit China together or when I'm teaching them about China to, to keep in mind, to help us understand what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, or what we're hearing. And the first one is that I find it very, very helpful to compare what's happened over time rather than always saying, well, we do this, but China does that, or we have this GDP per capita, China has only that. It, because that's not actually relevant. It's about where we've been and where we're going, and where China's been and where China's going. And so if you look at those early, early pictures and then look at what it looks like today, it's that, it's that process that we need to understand uh, that's, that's helpful. Oops, sorry. Um, so the second one is to understand that China is not a monolith. You know, we say, oh, China thinks this. You know, China doesn't think that. There's lots and lots of thought in China and different opinions and different interest groups, even at the highest level. So you'll have the Ministry of Petroleum disagree with the Ministry of Commerce, right? And they, and they compete for the kinds of policies that they want. 
Sound familiar, right? So you can lobby in China too, just like we do here. Um, and it's also, you know, there's different ethnic groups, there's different parts of the country. It's, it's a big place. And so even with Chinese food, every, seems Hill and Dale has their own cuisine. It, it, so it's, it's a very, very diverse place. And I think that gets missed when we read the Wall Street Journal, for example, right? It's just, that part is, it's all Beijing, it's all President Xi, it's, <coughs> it's like one decision and, and everybody dies. <coughs> and that's, that's not true. It is a single party system with the Chinese Communist Party and it doesn't tolerate other parties. No question about that. But that doesn't mean there's a lot of different opinions and interests and forces uh, shaping what happens in that country. The third thing is distinguish between the governments and people. Because it's, they're not the same. And um, there's also different levels of government. And so we may not like government policy, but that doesn't mean we can't like Chinese people. Right. There, it's just that there's that whole society of richness of culture and ideas and um, productivity and good things that can come out of working with people. So the, Setting up the U.S.-China economic relations, um, I would be remiss not to remind us that the U.S. and China has had long-standing positive relationships and with mutual interests um, with both countries. So we, we have to, I think, remember the good relationships and the good things that have, have come out of that relationship as we go into a period which is different. Right, which we have more concerns, and China has more concerns relative to us. But with the opening of China with our diplomatic relations in 1979, uh, we accomplished uh, basically the end of the Cold War with China's help, and then built an economic relationship that helped both countries, was very beneficial to both countries over many decades. And so the cru crux of my argument that I would like to present and share with you today is that the economic background of what we're looking at is the diminishing returns to trade. We've had lots and lots of trade with China, right? It's grown over time, and I'll show you some data in a minute. But that the additional benefits that we're going to get by trading even more with China are pretty small. And so, you know, the phase one trade agreement that we had under President Trump with China was probably not the right way to go because that was asking China to well, sell, buy more and more stuff, and, and that'll make things right. But that's not really where the two economies are anymore. So I would argue it really is about competition over innovation. So diminishing returns to trade, increasing returns to innovation. And that trade actually was more, was easier to handle and to manage because we had data and we could see what the products were. And, and, but innovation is harder. It's, um, you know, we don't know where innovation is going to lead us or where the companies in China are going to take it. And for some of the key technologies, we are both right on the frontier. So that's where the competition is really intense. And some of those frontiers have military dual use as well, right? So I think that's kind of the economic crux of some of the competition that, that we're looking at. And then we have the political reality, which is that from China's point of view, they see the West in decline. They see China's rising and the West is declining. And so that opens up a whole different set of opportunities for them from their point of view. 
And that President Xi is the kind of leader who wants to be remembered in a very positive historical light in the Chinese context. And so that means he must deliver very important things. <laughs> but somehow he's got to accomplish a lot of um, things that will matter in history 100, 200, 300 years later. And so he has big ideas and big plans. So one of the, the pieces of that is that he has orchestrated the top leadership to allow him to have a third term. You know, under Deng Xiaoping, it was set up that the leaders would have 10-year terms. After the first five years, they would pick a successor and groom them, and there would be peaceful transition, which isn't easy to do in a one-party system. But um, Deng Xiaoping set this up, and it worked pretty well until President Xi um, wants to be above that. The other thing he's done is changed the history, the party history of the Chinese Communist Party to make Xi Jinping thought to be at the same level as Mao Zedong thought. And so he's a new kind of leader, a modern, a leader of modern China on the level of Mao Zedong. At least that's where he's planting himself. So that context makes it even harder in some ways to, to maintain the kinds of relationships that we've had in the past. So I'm gonna review this in, in four parts. Um, some of it kind of overlaps, but I'll first give you this larger macro political economy uh, context. Okay. It wants to do its own thing. <laughs> okay, so the big, the big picture here is that both countries face economic challenges uh, that aren't necessarily dissimilar, but they're, they're not exactly the, the same either, but that the interconnection of our two economies is very, very deep. And that same interconnection helped both economies grow, and now it's causing more, it's causing some distrust and some, um, you know, some worries on both sides and tension that's, that's not helping the, the conversation. Um, so each one tends to blame the other for our problems, right? I mean, if, in any political camp, national political campaign, you would think China was running for office because it gets pointed to that with all these different problems and it's because of China. Well, China does the same thing. You know, the US, it's their, they're doing this and this, which isn't helping us. And so, you know, the, the domestic rhetoric around this relationship is pretty intense. Um, and uh, our companies, the comp Chinese companies working here and our US companies working there get caught in the middle. Right, so their political risk has risen. And, um, and so many of them are trying to decide what, you know, what, what they're going to do to continue. Okay, on the, from the Chinese perspective on growth, um, the, the story isn't very good. Right? We had a great story with 10, 12% growth for many, many years. And so this is at the top of, of that of that growth. And it's been slowly, slowly falling since. The good news is this is what we call a soft landing, right? That has decreased slowly over time um, and not just crashed. So they've a avoided a recession, except during COVID. Um, so th this um, downward slant is not good news for President Xi, right? He can't have an economy that doesn't function well and still be the grand leader. So in, um, in, in 20, last year, 2021, the economy actually rebounded to eight, just over 8%. And then with now this year, the plan is 5.5%. 
Um, but most analysts think it will be hard for China to reach that 5.5% um, because of all the, you know, COVID continues and lots of other issues uh, in, in the economy. Um, but nonetheless, it's not, it's not an upward trend. Now, from the U.S. point of view, we also have these challenges. Um, we have the financial crisis, we have the trade war with China, we have COVID, now inflation, and of course the war in, in Ukraine. And so often we look at our growth challenges and say, well, you know, it's because of trade with China or it's because you know, whatever is, is happening is not, um, is not working out for us. So the trade issue, this is China's trade globally, you know, not just in the US, but globally, starting in 1950. So you can see that in the first years under Mao, there was almost no trade at all. It was an autarkic economy. It did trade a little bit in order to get absolute essentials. But basically, it, it wasn't a trading uh, nation. Then with the opening under Deng Xiaoping, you can see there was a, an increase in trade. Um, and a lot of that was driven by foreign investment in southern China. And then in 2001, China joined the WTO. And that's when exports really took off. And today, they're high, but um, not growing as fast as they were before. But again, China's growth is not going to be propelled in the future by more trade. It, it really needs, this, needs structural change so that its growth is, is pushed by productivity and uh, consumer demand and things like that. Um, now, this is the U.S. export. And it's just important to note that the U.S. is also a very important exporting nation. And we export nearly as much as China does. And so, get my trend line in there. Um, and so we have had impressive um, success with exports too. The issue with China is, we both export to the world, but we buy more from China than China buys from us, right? So the trade deficit with China has been a big issue, particularly in the political realm. Um, and you can see the red bars are the US-China trade deficit, and the blue bars are the US total trade deficit. Um, so we clearly have trade deficits with lots of people, lots of countries around the world, and not just China, but China's been a, a big piece of that. And that, until recently at least, has caused a lot of tension. And you know, it, start, it was the basis of our trade war with China under President Trump. It hasn't gotten a lot of attention lately, and I think the reason is because right, what really matters is technology and innovation. Okay, so the view from China is, on the left-hand side, those pictures, it's a, are what it was like in 1976, and the two on the right are what, what it's like now. Um, so it, the top left one is the harbor in Shanghai in 1976, and you wouldn't even recognize it, you know, as a major city at that, that time, but it was China's major, major city um, at that time. And so it's a rapidly changing society and economy, um, largely uh, due to domestic changes in terms of freedoms, market reforms, investment, et cetera. So these companies and infrastructure are, are all domestic. And so it's, again, just a, a totally different um, economy. And the people in China are proud of that. You know, they have worked hard, they have uh, used smart policies, and they've reduced poverty, and modernized, and created wealth, and have um, you know, moved up in the world, say. Um, 
I could talk a whole talk on why, what are the success factors, but I will just say that um, having savings available for investment and investing wisely and a lot made a big difference. But that's also combined with the economic reforms that occurred over those decades. So without those reforms, this one wouldn't have succeeded. And for that, we give a lot of credit to Deng Xiaoping's leadership that made, that really pushed those reforms forward, even after Tiananmen, um, and invited Western investment, and promoted exports, and promoted um, production within the country, and pushed the Chinese companies to move up the value chain. <coughs> In a way, it's like a text, you know, a development textbook example of what you're supposed to do. And it's just, it's, for other countries, it's been very hard to do often. Um, although Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, they've all been very successful at this. Um, and China has followed behind them. Today, China's changing its approach to its uh, future uh, economic growth, where they want more sustainability and, of course, innovation, more resilience, so less dependence on the global economy, um, just like we would like a little less dependence on the global economy. And so not just focusing on growth anymore, but the quality of production and the quality of growth um, is becoming important, as well as environmental sustainability, um, and again, they're, they're independent. Uh, so one of the big uh, policy ideas that are in, in China is this notion of indigenous innovation. So again, really focusing on how can China be an innovative economy and what does it take to do that? So some years ago, this Made in China 2025 was an official policy, and this really worried people in the U.S. Because all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is, so the competition is now coming, again, from innovation, and, um, and so that China will be its own engine of growth um, with, at the frontier of some of these technologies. And so the policy statement 2025 listed 10 large categories of really sophisticated technology where they were going to focus. And it included things like robotics and artificial intelligence and semiconductors and green technology, um, these kinds of things, which from a development point of view is right where they're at. You know, that, that should be the next step. That makes a lot of sense from the economic point of view. Um, but from the global point of view, people are worried that it might, you know, if it has dual use, it's going to bolster the military, and if we don't trust China, how are they going to, you know, they're going to get ahead of us, and what does that mean? And so there's a lot of uh, back and forth about this. Um, so again, the U.S. is, is wondering uh, what what this means and how, how do we fight back. And we're still working this out. There's not a final answer, I would say. OK, so we can see that the US official kind of approach to China started to change in the second um, term of the Obama administration. And this is, was in response largely to the cyber theft that was occurring, that uh, industrial theft that was used to support the innovation push in China in part. Um, and so Obama's a pivot to Asia was an attempt to gather our allies and think about together how do we um, manage this relationship. Under the Trump administration, the focus was more on trade, but it also had a security bent to it. 
Um, meanwhile, China's Navy is the largest in the world today. They have, over the years, invested in ships. They have many more ships than we do, and they're, they're much newer than ours. And so this question of what's China's end goal, what is the purpose, what is happening, um, it gets asked more and more. Um, under the Trump administration, the U.S. started to scrutinize businesses more carefully, foreign investment coming into the U.S., but also U.S. businesses in China. And then, of course, COVID-19 occurred, and so that caused other kinds of, of concerns about the, um, the relationship. Now, with President Biden, uh, not that much has changed. Um, there are people in his administration who, are, who tend to downplay engagement today, but President Biden himself is more, well, let's engage, <laughs> let's talk. So it's a little unclear what the overall policy will end up being um, with the current, our current leadership. But U.S. worries about indigenous innovation are, are many, you know, that, that China will use state-supported incentives, there is local protection, keep our companies out, that they won't move forward on economic liberalization, there's dual use and espionage, all of these kinds of things. It kind of all goes together when we talk about innovation. Um, and, and China's aware of this. So today, they don't mention China 2025 anymore. It's like, moved, they've moved on, and they don't use that terminology, uh, in part to not provoke the US and other Western allies. It's not just the US. Okay, and with economics and business, of course, we have uh, the realities of this interdependence became very, very clear with COVID, and that there were critical health um, products that were only produced in China, and we needed them, and so you know we scrambled there for for quite a while, and it it raised again the knowledge or information about how integrated we are, and. Um, how that can matter. Nonetheless, China's markets are huge, and if you're a publicly traded company and not doing business in China, you're probably going to be in trouble in terms of investors. So there's a tremendous pressure to be in those markets, especially with the consumer goods markets. Um, that's where the growth is going to be in the future. And so it's very difficult to imagine us not participating in that market and that the, the scale of those markets do matter. So going forward, and you know, I will say I don't have any silver bullet or anything, but it, it, it is helpful, I think, to think about, so what does China want anyway? And so this was my list, that number one, they want to ensure that the Chinese Communist Party stays in power. That's the most important bottom line. Um, they want to maintain stability in their country. They want to avoid a middle income trap, which is the idea that China's economy will continue to fall and, and growth rates will fall and that it won't actually be able to come, become a high income country. Um, you know, from the development textbooks, China's doing absolutely everything they can to avoid that. But nonetheless, they do have some major structural issues in their economy, which is causing growth to slow. And having more economic stimulus is not going to help that. It's only going to make debt higher and have other, other problems. So it is a real concern. Um, oops, sorry. It's a little trickier than I thought. Um, they do want to complete the one China policy with Taiwan one way or another. Um, you know, we need to have smart policy to encourage that to be in a peaceful way. Uh, they want to gain international respect and they want to increase their role in the world, especially in Asia. You know, I think 
you know, that's very reasonable. This is a, a country that has gone from being very, very poor to being quite wealthy and powerful. Um, and they want to start to play a bigger role. Uh, under earlier leaders, they were more, um, you know, it's not time yet, right? We, we need to just be, learn from everyone else and just try to develop. But President Xi's attitude is different. I mean, he's, China's made it, at least to a certain stage, and now um, needs to, China needs to be part of the global system in a new way. So there's all kinds of books out there. This is just one. Uh, and has China won, you know, these kinds of, of great titles, but they're not necessarily great books. But um, So, you know, will there be a winner? Will there be a loser? And you know, I would argue such a trade-off is not inevitable. Uh, it's possible, but it's not inevitable. And, you know, we need to think about the fact that we do not want to have war with China, and China does not want to have war with us. And so in that context, think about ways to have more win-win. Um, and maybe it means, to some extent, pulling back for a while and see where President Xi goes with his, his policies and not making too many assumptions. I think it's also dangerous to just assume that everything China does is nefarious and that we have to counter them, because then in the end they will, right? They will end up being more assertive, and that's not what we want. So one of the things that does disturb me is that especially under President Trump, the connections between the U.S. and China at all kinds of levels have been decimated. You know, there used to be working groups in different parts of the government, even Social Security, for example, that would communicate back and forth and learn from each other. We had student exchanges, we had faculty exchanges, we had, of course, you know, many kinds of conferences and things. And that has gotten, I mean, it's, of course, with COVID, it's now, it doesn't exist. But even before COVID, it, each one of them was closed down one by one. And so our understanding, our ways to understand China have disappeared. And I think that's dangerous. So how we go forward, I think China really does need to think about how can they be a more responsible global citizen. They don't like to talk about it that way, but that's okay. Um, but to work on, you know, what is the transparency of their intentions? You know, what, what are their long-term goals? and a willingness to work within the framework for IPR protection and cyber theft and open their domestic markets. Um, and things like with their One Belt, One Road investment project to normalize that process with transparency. Right? They've done some of that domestically so they could do that um, with their investments abroad as well. And to continue their reforms at home. With the U.S., clearly we will, if we engage, it'll be selectively. So, in other words, when, if there's very sensitive technology, then that technology is going to be protected. Um, and companies are gonna to have to reevaluate what, what they do with China in that respect. But I think the U.S. also could do more transparency on intentions and what are our long-term goals. Because we have had very high-level government officials call for regime change in China. That's extremely dangerous. It's, and it's not necessary. Right? You can't, so how, how is President Xi and the Communist Party gonna be that? Because we've been known to do regime change in other places. It's not, you know, it's not just words. So again, our, what are our intentions long term? And we, as, a superpower for a very long time have to accept the fact that other economies are going to grow and do well. And so I, I call it the rise of the rest. And so we need to accommodate the rise of other countries. And you know, we won't be as big relative to other countries as we have been in the past, but we'll still be very important. 
There's, and there's, there's no reason for that not to happen. Um, and then also to work on our own challenges at home. If we're strong at home, then we can manage with our allies and, and our, um, our competitors much better. Okay, so Ukraine, just a, I have one minute, that's fun. <laughs> so Ukraine, um, of course, complicates things a little bit more. Last week was a little tense, um, not knowing what China's leadership was going to do in terms of supporting Russia or not. Um, it looks like China will try to play both sides, as usual, but um, not help Russia militarily. They, I don't believe they wanted Putin to invade Ukraine. It's not in China's interest at all. Um, and, but they also don't like the ex expansion of NATO, and they really don't like sanctions. Right, so, so it was just a couple years ago where Huawei and ZTE were sanctioned, and then other companies were sanctioned by the US. These are Chinese companies, and they really are unhappy about that. So with our sanctions on Russia, it's like, yeah, we don't we don't like that. Don't don't do that. Uh, but still, I don't think that China's going to throw its lot in with Putin under the current circumstances. So that that's good news. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that the members have questions of Dr. Prime. We have a we had a microphone in the middle of the room. Please bring it back. Here it is. Any members, members of the Economic Club would like to ask Dr. Prime a question? Great job. Please come forward. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Prime. Thank you so much for a very uh, insightful commentary about today. So you mentioned the need for mutual respect. I know this is going to sound uh, kind of phobic, but how can an American democracy, which doesn't want to control other countries, deal with a country like China that wants to use subterfuge, spying, uh, all of the nefarious things that dictatorships want to do in their goal is to dominate the world, or, or do I have it wrong? Well, that's a big assumption. <laughs> I guess I, I wouldn't start with the assumption that China wants to dominate the world. I don't think it's helpful. Um, and, you know, all countries spy. So it, it, it's a part of being realistic, I think. And um, also trying to find those areas where it's beneficial to more than China to, to work with them. Um, so, I think I might have missed the first part of your question, but... No, it's just that, you know, America, we want to see everybody rise, but that China really doesn't want to... The perception is that China wants to see everybody rise. They want to control them while they're, while they're helping oh, them rise. Oh, okay. So, one of, one of the things is that really where the story is, is domestically within China. And we need to see how that plays out. And we, we've influenced it in great ways by you know, being part of, of their economic development process and by having people visit here and we visit there and having that, that interaction. But how <coughs> China's politics actually moves forward will depend on China. And there's you know, lots of people in China who do not agree with President Xi's position and are unhappy with who lost the US, right? Because our, that relationship has been really important in all kinds of aspects of Chinese society. So, you know, to some extent, we just have to wait and see how, how it plays out. But not, I think, just not act like, well, everything China does is bad for us, you know? Next question. Yes, thank you very much, Bob. Your presentation is very, very informative. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is um, why has President Xi, um, why has President Xi pursuing a third term? And the second reason is, is there a reason 
or why has there been an increase in political restrictions within China on the President Xi? Thank you. You mean like political, like in Xinjiang or what? Uh, well, political, like uh, there's less political freedom. Oh, less China. political freedom. But, but is there, is there a reason behind that? Because in America, sometimes you know, there, there may be an underlying reason, such as economic reforms, or, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily know. So are there reasons for both? Um, well, I, remember, I'm not a political scientist. <laughs> I'm an economist. I do live with one, but. <laughs> but so I haven't studied elite politics and President Xi, like some people have. But people do argue, analysts do argue, that President Xi is the kind of person who does want ultimate power in, within China. So he's, he's behaving much differently than other leaders in China have, except for Mao. So he's behaving a little bit like Mao did once they won the Civil War and he established the People's Republic of China. Um, and then there was a cult of Mao. So now there's a cult of President Xi. And so, you know, and it's, it's not, I, don't, I wouldn't argue that one person alone can make all of these, you know, all of these changes work. But he has, through the anti-corruption campaign and through other political maneuvering, gotten his supporters in, in the key positions. So he, he has a lot of support at that very, very highest level. Um, and, you know, and you can think about the counter of that or the, uh, the support of that is some loss of political freedom for other people, right? So you can't, you can't criticize Xi, um, but, you know, that hasn't ever been very popular in China anyway <laughs> to criticize the top leaders, <laughs> although debate about policy has been more open in the past than it is now. And, and that's unfortunate. And it doesn't help President Xi either. Next question. Yeah, so for about 10 years, I used to take undergraduate students to China. And like you, I found it to be fascinating. You know, you go every summer and you see uh, high speed rail, um, uh, more mobile phones, more people, urbanization, uh, cars. I went to a car show in China, which, by the way, if you ever get to do that, it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> but the biggest change I saw over the course of 10 years of the internet uh, and the restriction of the freedom of information and, and sharing information. And I think all of us would agree this one that in you know, Western liberal democracy, uh, the free exchange of ideas and marketplace of ideas is, is um, important and a contributor to innovation. How does she manage this? You know, if you watch him on TV, you know, it's Chinese way and our way. So she gives a lot of the middle class and you know, they leave China to go to other places. Um, are they going to rise up? Is this a rubber band that keeps stretching and breaks for Are they a lack of their conditions that will live along the way? Yeah, well, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, and we don't know. It's definitely the case that there are a lot of people in China who do not like the increased route restrictions, um, but there's also a lot of ways around them. <laughs> so, you know, you know, it's, people are. <coughs> People in China also like stability. They don't want chaos. So they don't want another cultural revolution or something like that. They, and, you know, so, but nonetheless, I mean, there's demonstrations across China all the time when people get fed up. And I think, you know, I learned from my political scientist friends <laughs> that one of the hardest things to do in, a, in an autocracy is to keep the power, right? If, I mean, because there's no way for society to say, hey, we don't like this, right? And unless the whole society does it and it all comes tumbling down. So that, and President Xi is pretty isolated with his supporters, so you, you just don't know. I, you know, I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, but, you know, people in China could get fed up with the direction that, that it, China's going. And it is different than it was before. Having said that, though, they're also doing very well. I mean, the middle class is quite comfortable. And, you know, they don't want to give that up. Um, but the pressures on housing, the cost of housing, and the environmental pressures, that, those are things that the government is really focusing on because that's what the people want. 
is affordable housing and clean air and clean water. So the government also is quite responsive to people and to their, you know, to their interests. Unlike a government like in Cuba, which is, just doesn't make any sense to me at all, how they think they can continue to rule and starve their civilians. I mean, it's just China's not like that. When they see a problem, they, they tackle it. And so they've done very well for their people. And that's a trade-off most people in China are willing to take for now. One more question, Mr. White. Hey, would you comment on the recognition of the rule of law in Chinese culture and also, um, in your judgment, is the uh, Chinese Communist Party trustworthy? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't think I'll that. That's easy. <laughs> well, I mean, the Chinese Communist Party is trustworthy in the way I just mentioned that they are responsive, responsive to the people. They do want to be in power, however, and so if you have any idea about starting another party, you're gonna be in jail before you think twice. You know, but people understand that. Um, in terms of rule of law, it has gotten more sophisticated in China, more developed. They have law schools and, um, but the legal system, is culturally different than ours, and it really matters. So you are guilty <coughs> until proven innocent. And it's just the opposite. It still can work, but it's just so different. It's hard for us to say, oh, there's any rule of law at all. But that's not true. There is. And it's gotten better in terms of separating the judicial um, system from the party. It's not perfect. <laughs> um, and if you're one of the legacy party people, like President Xi is, is called the Princelings, so you're the son or daughter of one of the revolutionaries that fought with Mao, you can fix things. If you're not one of them, you often can't fix things, right? So, you know, it's, it's, a, so it's a very different system. I'll end there. <laughs> <laughs>